Hi everyone, um, as you can see this is going to be a video on momentum. So I'm going to spend time talking about what momentum is, um, talk about the change of momentum, and talk about this concept of impulse. Um, so while introducing momentum, um, you know the biggest thing about momentum that really needs to kind of be highlighted is this, um, that momentum is actually another conservation law that we're going to learn about. Um, and honestly, the major difference between momentum and energy is usually when we study energy, it's the study of one object, where momentum is the study of collisions or an interaction, two objects. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to see very similar things as in energy, that momentum is conserved as long as there's no external forces on the system. And of course, this is a couple um, lecture slides later, but that's the big thing here. So as you can see with the big idea, Momentum is conserved for all collisions as long as um, external forces don't interfere. And actually, um, although we are going to talk about things colliding with one another, really we're going to talk about an interaction when things make contact. Um, and we'll find that all of Newton's laws can come back to play and help us describe how things move. So, um, like I said, we're going to talk about what momentum is and the change of momentum. And then we'll worry about uh, conservation and types of collisions later on. But this is kind of where we're going. And then, of course, everything's related to each other. So we're going to talk about how energy plays a role in relation. Um, you know, energy plays a role in our collisions. So we, you know, coming back to Newton's first law of motion. You know, objects at rest stay at rest. You know, objects have this thing called inertia. They want to keep doing what they're doing, so you know, an object at rest stays at rest. Um, so I kind of like to think of momentum as the part of Newton's laws that talks about objects in motion stay in motion. Um, that really is momentum, because basically, um, as I'll describe momentum later, momentum is kind of like a moving inertia. It wants to stay moving as it was previously doing. And then, of course, just to be complete here, um, the second part of Newton's, the third part of Newton's law, unless acted by an outside force, that's basically a segue into Newton's second law. So we're kind of looking at, um, initially, we're looking at this part here. So like I said, um, momentum in a conceptual manner is inertia in motion. How hard is it to change the motion of an object once it's already moving? So if you can think about, you know, my, you know, what might change an object's momentum without, you know, knowing how to calculate it, um, hopefully two things come to mind. Uh, if you notice, I have a football player here. Um, football players can be one of two things or both things, but they could either be massive, right? So your linebackers are usually these pretty massive people. Um, so they're going to be harder to move once they're moving, right? or some other things that have mass that are really hard to move once they're moving. Things that are really large, like a truck, for example. I mean, a planet is a great example. Um, you know, a cruise ship. Um, so anything that really has a really large mass, a wrecking ball. You know, the point of the wrecking ball, right, is to keep moving once it hits the wall <laughs> um, and destroy it. But those are things that will be hard to change the motion once since it's motion. Um, and the other variable or thing that would be hard um, once it's moving, it's the motion itself. So if something's moving really fast, it's probably going to keep its speed. Um, that's mostly due to Newton's first law. Um, objects in motion stay in motion. Um, but if you think about it, um, you know, if you, I'm trying to think of something really fast, but if you have a car on the highway, once it's in motion, it will stay in motion. So um, if it counteracts something else, it's more likely that it's going to keep its motion. But momentum is actually the two of these factors. It's mass and velocity. These two things contribute to the inertia in motion. So really, uh, we can quantify the amount of moving inertia or momentum through the equation P equals mv. So P actually stands for momentum. Obviously m is mass, so we can't use that for momentum. Um, it's usually a lowercase p. Um, and as you can see from the calculation, mass times velocity, momentum has the units of kilograms meters per second. And these are our typical variables we use, mass in kilograms and V for velocity. So 
momentum is actually a vector, and this comes from velocity. Velocity is a vector, and when you multiply a vector and a scalar, it becomes a vector. So momentum is also a vector. Um, you'll find that we'll have to now start thinking about direction, you know. The good thing about energy was we didn't never consider that, but this actually matters, so we need to pay attention to direction. And of course, we usually model our, you know, opposite direction with negative signs. So these are just some quick calculations of momentum because momentum is just mass times velocity. So just to kind of make a point here. So a person walking, you know, I just picked a random mass for a person. This is typical, a 60 kilogram person. And, you know, walking speed is about a meter and a half. So that person would have a quantity of momentum of 90 kilograms meters per second. Let's take that same person and have them run now. So their momentum is 720. So you can see that a person that's running is going to have more moving inertia. And then let's take it to the extreme, right? Let's take that person and now they become Superman, right? So Superman goes about, you know, this, what is it, speeding bullet. So that's 150 meters per second, which is about 300 miles per hour. Point being, it's really fast. So Superman has an extreme amount of momentum. In other words, that once he's moving, he's going to kind of keep that motion. So that's what momentum conceptually kind of means. So how do you change an object's momentum? Well, Newton's first law says an object in motion won't stay in motion unless there is a outside force. It's all connected. Here we are again. So this is just a really simple example, um, although highly unlikely. But if you take a tennis ball and it hits a wall, it's going to be encounter it encounters a force. The wall, you know, applies a force on the ball. And um, what I meant by highly unlikely is the tennis ball comes to a dead stop. That's probably not true, but just use it for the example. Is that once you apply a force, the momentum of the object changed. So you can see that it started with 30 meters per second and ended with zero. So the fact that the momentum changed means that there must have been a force. So that's another way you can kind of think of that. So you need to apply a force to change an object's momentum. And generally, we're going to look at a velocity changes, although, yes, you can actually change the mass of an object and therefore its momentum. So let's not eliminate that possibility. Uh, one example of that is um, when you study uh, rockets, really. Um, you have one to two stage rockets where the rockets will be um, launched from Earth and then they drop off part of their um, launching gear. Of course, it's a lot more efficient when you don't have as much more, you know, as much weight. So they usually do that for that reason. But your momentum will change because you've changed your mass. Your velocity changes too, but we're not going to move into that. But that's a, a rocket problem you'll do in graduate school. Very fun stuff. So let's just um, talk about calculating a change in momentum. So like I said previously, you're generally going to assume that the mass stays the same. Uh, we're usually not going to change the mass. Um, AP might ask you conceptual mass questions, but usually not um, computational changing mass questions. So if you notice, the change of momentum, as I have written here, um, is equal to an object that changes is velocity. So let's just quickly do this. Um, so if I have the change of momentum of a case A, it's M. So this is important. Final minus initial. We can't mix these up, which means that our mass is 0.65 kilograms. Our final velocity is zero. Notice the ball comes to a rest. Our initial velocity, since it's going to the right, is positive 30 meters per second. So I'm going to go ahead and calculate this out. 30 times 0.65. My momentum change is negative 19.5 kilograms meters per second. So the change of momentum is negative. 
So think about what that means. Um, you can interpret this a couple different ways. You can see that the final velocity was less than the initial, so this object slowed down, right? That's one way you can think about this change in momentum. Um, or you can think of it as a loss of momentum, right? The negative sign lost that momentum because it originally had 30 and then it actually technically, you know, disappeared at the end. So it lost that momentum. So you can kind of think of the change a couple different ways. So since I have this nice little answer box, let's go ahead and write the answer here. Very good. Okay, let's do the next one. Change the momentum here will be the mass times the final velocity. Sorry, this should be an F. Let's just make that an F. It's going to the left, so that will be negative 30 meters per second minus positive 30 meters per second. Now, do not be fooled. It does not cancel. Remember, the negative is just the same as adding the opposite, so these actually kind of add up. I'm just going to rewrite it. Negative 30 plus negative 30 gives you negative 60. Okay. So 0.65 times 60 gives you negative 39 kilograms, meters per second change in momentum. So if you notice something about these two cases, um, we kept the mass the same. You notice there's a greater change in momentum when you change direction. So assuming again all these things are the same, it's pretty interesting. You lose, um, not only do you lose momentum in this case, case B, but you go the opposite way. So you, you have to stop to do that, right? So you stop and then you turn around and you go backwards. So this negative 39 kind of incorporates you going the opposite way in the end. Um, can you tell exactly what's going on without, you know, this visual? Not really. You kind of need the visual to kind of help you interpret it. Um, but the most important thing to get from this is that you have to pay attention to the direction and your signs. So if the answer is negative, you just leave it negative. It's, it's totally fine like that. So we actually can define change momentum in another way we could talk about this thing called impulse. So impulse is defined as the amount of time a force is felt as it changes the momentum. So the change of momentum is impulse. And we represent it as I for impulse is equal to how much force is fe felt over a period of time. So a quick derivation of where this comes from. So let me just show you really quick. So I'm going to do delta P is equal to MV final minus MV initial like this. So if you dig back into your toolbox, this almost looks like acceleration except we need time. So final minus initial over T. Now, what you can do with mathematics is you can actually, as long as you apply this to both sides, you don't actually change the definition. So I'm actually going to divide both sides by t. As long as I do that, um, I don't actually mess with this, you know, this equation right here, this equality sign. What this allows me to do is say that delta p over t is equal to m, and this whole part is a, right? Okay, maybe you can see where I'm going with this. MA is equal to a force. 
So delta P over T is equal to a force. And therefore, the change in momentum is the same as having a force over time. But instead of writing delta P, we're going to write it as I right here. So that's where this comes from. It comes from basically that the change in momentum is also, or can be interpreted as how much force is applied and how long that force is applied to. So again, this time is how much, is how much time the force is felt. So notice if you, you know, they say to follow through on your bat when you swing, right? Well, if you are in con, if the ball's in contact with the bat, if T is larger here, then the change of momentum will be larger, right? Which means that you're going to get and gain a bigger change in velocity, which of course is what you want to do with baseball. So that's, you know, one application of this. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more applications, but I'm going to show you what is called the impulse momentum theorem. Basically, I'm going to say that the change in momentum is equal to impulse. And since they're both the same thing, essentially, I'm going to set them equal to each other here. This is incredibly useful if you find something changing velocity and you need to find out how long the force was felt for or how much force is felt. Um, this is, uh, again, very, very, very helpful for finding um, another technique for finding force. I'm um, sorry, this got cut off. It says, uh, best use when relating a change of velocity force in time. Yeah, so if you find that your problems have velocity force in time, this is the, the method to go through. Um, so, if you think about it, right, you kind of know what's going to happen, but let's pretend that we sort of don't. Um, but if you take an egg and you let it drop on the floor, we kind of all know what's going to happen. The egg is going to crack and it's going to leave a messy eggshell egg on the floor, which would be fun to clean up, right? But even from the same height, and we drop it on a pillow, assuming perfect conditions, that egg may not break. It might actually, you know, stay there. So the question is, you know, they both will have the same initial velocity. Since in this very special case, they would have the same change of position, it means that they will have the same final velocity, which means they both actually technically have the same change of momentum. The question is, what's the difference about them? Well, speeding up is that it's the surface they hit, right? The pillow will absorb the force for a longer time, where this wood has a teeny tiny time. Well, if you're going to absorb the force for longer, then it's going to reduce the force felt. And this is a small time, so it's going to be a big force. So that's why the egg cracks on the floor versus the pillow. We kind of know this as absorbing, you know, people, you know, when you think of um, non-physics kind of way to describe it, the pillow absorbed the energy, right? Uh, well, the correct way to say it is that the contact time was very large, which means it reduces the force. And then vice versa, the contact time of this was very small, so it dramatically increases the force. Speaking of forces, let's return back to this example really quickly. And let's assume the force is felt for the same time since the ball hits the wall um, in both of those cases. Let's assume that it's felt that. So um, if you remember, I'm just going to go off from the slides before that the change of momentum for this was negative 19.5 kilograms meters per second. And the change of momentum before was negative 39. Well, the change of momentum is equal to the impulse. The change of momentum is force times time. Let's solve for force in each of those cases. 
So negative 19.5 kilograms meters per second is equal to force times the contact time, which is pretty small for um, this situation, um, but that's okay. So solving for force, so 19.5 divided by 0.05, I get negative 390 newtons of force. Okay. The negative just means that the force is applied opposite to the direction of motion. So as you might imagine, the direction of motion was initially this way and the force was applied that way. Hopefully that negative sign makes sense. Let's do the same calculation here. And then we'll find the force is 39 divided by 0.05. Seven hundred and eighty. Oops, negative. That's also negative. So we already said that case B had a greater change of momentum, but assuming all other conditions are the same, notice that the wall that um, has a change of velocity has the greater force. And I hope that makes sense because in order to not only be stopped but to change directions, you need way more force. Way more fun. <laughs> oh boy. Way more force. Like that. So generally, you'll experience more force, generally, because yes, you can change conditions, but let's keep them the same for the time being. You'll generally feel more force when you bounce off things. So in other words, if you're on the bumper cars and you hit a wall and you stop, you're going to feel less force than if you hit a bumper car of your friend and you bounce off that car and go a different direction, according to physics. This is a very similar example to what I just did, um, but it's... Um, Kind of, um, I like this in that it kind of gives you a real life example of how this is applied. Um, so imagine that a car is losing control and crashes into a tree. I know this is really, like really not the greatest thing ever, <laughs> um, but it's interesting to think about the forces something or someone might experience. So the person is 70 kilograms here moving 35 meters per second when they suddenly come to rest. So let's look at the dashboard contact time versus the airbag, right? So compare the forces. So I'm going to use the impulse momentum theorem, which says that the change in momentum is equal to FT. Um, so let's do the airbag first. So this would be 70 kilograms for the person. The final velocity is zero because they stop. 35 meters per second is equal to force times 0.75 seconds. Let's go ahead and solve for this. 70 times 35 divided by 0.37. You get negative 3, oops, yeah, 3266.7. Newtons of force with the airbag. All right, let's compare it with the dashboard. Once again, the change of momentum actually happens to be the same, but what changes is the contact time, right? The dashboard is a lot harder, so you're going to actually have a shorter contact time. So let's go ahead and solve this out again. So you get a force of 13,000, oh, not even, 100 and, yeah, right? I wrote that right. I did. Oh, boy. 132,692. This is just extra 
3.3 newtons. 3,000? 132,000. It's a humongous difference here. Um, we can actually find the g-force of this. So the force of gravity of this person, 70 kilograms, sorry for the terrible, this is horrible, I'm sorry. 70 kilograms times 9.81 is this person's weight or its g-force, 686.7 newtons. So if I want to know how many g's this person felt with the airbag, I'm going to take that number and divide it by the weight. So 3266 divided by 7 divided by 686.7. This is just for fun. You don't need to know this. This is about 4.8 g's. That's getting to the point where you're very uncomfortable. You know, on most roller coasters, you might experience 2 g's. Maybe three, but very unlikely. Four Gs, you start feeling faint and, you know, you start feeling the physical effects of your own body resisting the change of motion. So in other words, you hit an airbag, it still really hurts. So let's do the other one. Taking the force divided by the weight of the person. It's 193 Gs. That is, I literally don't even know what would happen because that's so many G's. <laughs> Point being is you experience a lot of force. So that's why those airbags are in your cars. Um, I mean, obviously, you know they're meant to protect you um, during a collision, but hopefully these numbers show you the difference in um, dashboard versus airbag and how much they actually do protect you. These are just some more calculations of impulse, so if you're feeling impulsive, <laughs> um, and doing some more of these calculations, you may. The answers are in the bottom here, so I'm not going to do these out right now. Uh, but these are all different ways you can kind of see this. Um, this is mixed practice, so of course you, you know, and in physics, it doesn't have to be a pure impulse momentum problem. We can actually add all the stuff that we learned previously, right? Um, so these are those type of prep questions, but you know, you can um, use impulse momentum to solve the first part and maybe, you know, a different like kinematics to solve the second part. But anyway, um, I'm going to skip these as well just because these are just, you could just try them on your own. If you have questions, you can let me know. I'll do this in class, so more on that later. Um, yeah, you might have heard of this too, like roll with the punches. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, I have. Um, quick little story, I used to do karate, and they actually did teach you this in karate, um, that if you were to get punched, um, of course, surprisingly, you're not supposed to punch people when you learn karate. In fact, it's actually pretty, well, obviously pretty disrespectful, but it shows that you don't have control, so it's actually um, showing weakness. So you're you're trying to show control when you actually try to punch somebody while doing karate. But, um, but anyway, if you're in the unfortunate event that you are punched, you kind of want to go with it because you're increasing the contact time. If you increase the contact time, you reduce the force. Um, so not that you would do such a thing, but if you went in the opposite direction of the punch as shown here, yes, you're going to feel a greater force, a greater change in momentum. Yes, these are all, yes. And these are hopefully pretty obvious that, you know, this is when you hit a wall, it's a small force. I'm sorry, small time, so greater force. If you hit a haystack, you're in contact with the force longer, so that gives you a smaller force. Okay, 
So the next part that is pretty important, especially in the AP, is graphing. And of course, what better way to do things is to graph forces in time. But if you notice, impulse by definition is force times time. If you have a graph of force and time, you take the area of that graph, it doesn't have to be a triangle, in fact I'll just even do it like this, force and time. Let's say you have a constant force over time. The area under this would be the impulse. So the impulse. Because anytime you take area, right, it would be the force times the time. The area of that triangle is, or that rectangle, rectangle is force times time. So the area under the curve is the integral. Um, well, that wasn't what it meant. I meant impulse, but yes, it's also the integral. So, you know, if you want to be fancy, there is the integral, which is essentially saying the same thing here. So anytime I see a force and a time, I think impulse. Um, they love these on the AP. Oh, look, an AP problem. So why don't we take a quick peek at this. So we have a block that slides along the floor with no friction with that speed when it collides with another block, which was initially at rest. The graph below represents the force on the three kilogram block by that block as a function of time. Find the initial momentum, the impulse, and then the momentum after. So part A says the initial momentum of the two kilogram block. So, Momentum is mv. So we have two kilogram blocks slides along the floor with this speed. Okay, that's all we needed, the initial momentum, right? Sometimes life is that simple. You can take two numbers and actually just multiply them together. There you are. Part A, that's the momentum of the, that's the initial momentum. Part B. What is the impulse? So immediately, if I see a graph, I'm going to use it. So um, if I find the area under the curve, that would be the impulse. So let's, um, if you noticed, I made the graph just bigger to read. Um, and of course, it doesn't always have to start at zero. If you notice, this is a highlighted section. But I'm going to actually do this. To kind of that's supposed to be in the middle ish so that if this is 0 0.08 then this is 0 0.075 here is that right there so I'm actually going to find this triangle first call this one and since it's pretty much symmetric then two should be the same as one and I can just add them together so one, the area underneath that curve, is going to be the, it's going to be one half because it's a triangle, the base, which is 0 0.075 minus 0 0.05, so minus the base times the height, 0. 025 is the bottom length, and notice that I only took the difference between them. This is in seconds. And then the height of this goes from here to 800. We start at 0, we go to 800, so this is just a solid 800. 0.5 times 0 0.025 times 800. Out of all that, the first triangle is 10. And the units for impulse are newton seconds. Because notice the newtons in the seconds here. Well, I too must also be 10 due to symmetry. So the area is going to be 10 newton seconds plus 10 newton seconds, which gives you 20 newton seconds. So let's just go back to the previous problem. Impulse exerted on that block. Now, notice that I 
it collides with this block, that's going to feel the force. What did I say? 20. Over the time. And that's exactly what this is. This is the force the object felt over that period of time, like this. Then it says, what's the momentum of the block immediately after this collision? Well, this is also known as the change in momentum, right? So, we can kind of write the change of momentum is equal to the final minus the initial. This will feel the same change in momentum because it feels the same impulse through the Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, so both blocks feel this. So I can actually use the 20. We're solving for the final. The initial was 40. So in order for that to equal 20, we have to add that over. Hold on, I did something wrong. What did I do wrong here? Um, Oh, actually, I know what's wrong with this. Um, I'm just going to keep going because the process is right, um, but the answer is going to come out a little weird, and I'll explain it in a second. So, yeah, this is actually how you would do it. Um, um, so that would mean you have to move this over, so this would be 60. Um, now, notice the units here, kilograms, meters per second, newton seconds, they're the same. But since um, we're going specifically momentum, I'm going to change it back to this. So that's how you find that part. Now, um, the process is completely correct, but honestly, um, I think this graph is wrong um, because it's showing this as a positive impulse, right, because it's above the y-axis, but actually, this should be negative because if you think about what this means, it said the final momentum of the block um, was more than what it initially had. So we had the two kilogram block hit a three kilogram block at rest and then the three kilogram block kind of went off and had its own momentum change of this and then we're saying that this actually went in the same direction um, with a change of 22 um, but or in other words Anyway, it's saying that it went the same direction with more momentum than it started because it started with, what, 40 and it went to 60. And, of course, this does not make sense. What does make sense is if this graph were negative because then this number would be negative and then this number would become... So if I add 40 over, um, this would be... Um, 20. That makes more sense. Anyway, um, like I said, I think this graph is just wrong. But the way I solved this was actually fine. You know, you would use, if given the situation, regardless of whether or not they know the graph is right or wrong, I would do it that way because that's the correct way of doing that. Um, so you'll see this on the AP, so this is just another AP example of this. So same thing, you're finding the, you know, the area underneath the curve for the impulse. So find the change in momentum is the same as impulse. So they try to trick you here, right? You're like, oh no, I don't have any velocity or mass. Well, they do give you force and time. So again, you find the area under that. 
I'll do the same, literally it's the same method because of the way this is drawn. I'll do this triangle first. So the area will be one half times the base, which is t over two times the height plus the second triangle, which is the same. So what happens is the twos combine, so I get ft over 4 plus ft over, sorry, that should be an f, t over 4, 4 and 4, 1 fourth plus 1 fourth gives you 2 fourths, which is the same as 1 half answer is that one. So that's how they can present it as an AP uh, multiple choice example. And this is another fun multiple choice example as well, which you can try on your own with that. So anyway, um, in class I'll do some demonstrations to kind of show this. I'll have a force sensor, so obviously, and what I'll have is a little plunger, so actually um, just like you did for before, this will actually measure the impact force. So I should be able to get a force versus time graph here via the force sensor. And we should see something very similar to what we saw, so something like this. So I'm going to find the integral of this, or the area here, because that's going to be the impulse. With the motion detector, we're going to measure the change in velocity of this cart. So this cart will be moving at some initial velocity, and then the final is going to be pretty much zero. So this will measure vi, uh, and then we can use the change of momentum and verify that these are the same. So I'll find the mass of the cart, put the scale, and then I'll find the initial velocity here. And ideally, the area on the curve that we find up here should equal to the change in momentum that we find there. So we'll see how well that works in lab, or in demo. So yeah, so that concludes the, um, the slides on the initial, or the introduction to momentum. So momentum is mv. Change of momentum is m delta v, and that the change of momentum can be related to impulse, where impulse is force times time, and or that we could, sorry I'm running out of room, I'm just going to come way over here, or we could do the impulse momentum theorem and just work with them together. Um, bouncy objects, things that bounce experience more force. If you increase the contact time, you reduce the force. And that the area under a force time graph is impulse. So these are kind of the biggest things I want you to kind of get from this. The next class and or videos will be conservation of momentum. Thanks.